Thank you. Thank you, Nadine. And uh, good evening to you all. And thank you very much to the British Library of hosting this uh, tonight's event. Um, so we've been told tonight to share some of our stories and along the side, some tips to you, uh, because some of you might be looking to start your own business and some of you might be uh, having some difficulties and some questions already, but feel, feel free to ask. And so as Nadine said, I run a business called May.com and um, our mission is to democratize high-end designs and make it accessible to everyone on the high street in the UK, but also now in Europe uh, for them to buy. But I thought maybe I should start from the beginning and tell you a little bit how we started. So maybe I, let me start with myself and my, so I'm 34 years old t this year and I spent exactly half of my life in China where I grew up and the other half of my life in France and then in, um, in the UK. And the town where I grew up in is called Foshan. Now most of you may never have heard of the name but it happens to be actually one of the biggest manufacturing base of furniture in China, so probably in the world. And it never occurred to me that would be very useful until one day I decided to buy myself a couch. And um, that was at a time when I finished my work, my first job from investment banking, so I had a bit of bonus and I wanted to spend. And I had my eye on this beautiful piece of furniture, a couch, a leather Chesterfield couch, um, 3,000 pounds, just around the corner from where, where I lived. And I was just about to buy it. But I took a picture with my iPhone, and I showed it to a friend who I grew up with back in China. And I showed him, because he went on to talk, take over his parents' factory, and he's a specialist of um, manufacturing of the sofas. And he say, you know what, buddy? I make this sofa myself. Uh, he, he, the interesting part is that he actually didn't recognize the brand that uh, I wanted to buy from, but he recognized the, the, the shape and design. So, of course, I was very curious. And guess what I asked him as a question? How much you were selling for? And he told me $300. <laughs> and that was really um, quite something for me because um, the first thing, he was selling a $300, $300 sofa. Um, and then somehow the sofa ended up 3,000 pounds on the high street. The second thing is that he had no idea he was selling the sofa to. And, and along the side, we discovered that actually whenever you buy something on the high street, there are importers, agents, you know, wholesalers, you name it, um, loads of intermediaries, loads of middlemen who take a cut. And quite often, one item ends up from one to seven to 10 at the end for your customers, for you. Um, so I thought internet, so, so I thought, of course, I'm going to buy for myself for a start, but um, there may be something that I can make a business out of it. So internet happens to be the right medium and the right channel for us to group volume and aggregate the demand to meet the factory's requirement. Factory and designers, they can only work in batch. They cannot work by piece. Um, that was the idea of May.com. And the... Now looking back, we are selling in seven countries. Uh, we have about 250 people working for us, and we are still growing uh, about one to two people every week. So it sort of all makes sense. But looking back then, it wasn't that obvious that you should start a business because first, when I first when I graduated, maybe some of you know the case of some of you here, I had no idea what I wanted to do, and. As I mentioned earlier, I went into investment banking as my first job um, because I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I thought the least I could do to myself is to get a well-paid job, to get a lot of money. And as I got into investment banking, I, um, which was a very prestigious, you know, good name, uh, well-paid, which job consisted mainly in, you know, endless Excel crunching and sorry, you know, PowerPoint slides uh, all night long. Um, I find myself starting to a little bit get um, you know, late for work and you know, even a little bit depressed. And that's how I realized that I wanted exactly the opposite you know, what, in terms of my career, in terms of my, my professional aspiration. And if you ask some of um, you know, my friends who are entrepreneurs and you know, why starting business, and you may get some answers, you know, we want to change the world. As for me, I was a little bit more selfish. I just want to find a job for myself, something that I can really enjoy, and something that's synonym of freedom, of something that you can 
get excited in bed, you know, when you get up and you, you go to work and you can expect some surprises, whatever that means. Um, and so starting the business for me was um, a meaning of getting a job that's just right for myself. And now we're creating jobs not only for ourselves, but also for other people. And we are also solving a problem for our customers. So, um, you know, we, we feel just so lucky and so grateful that we are where we are today. But without the, the beginning, without the sparkle, and without the, the opportunity, and without the, um, the desire to go to the bottom of it, we would never have um, been through this uh, long journey. So, we've been around for five and almost six years now, and I think one of the themes tonight, I think you said we should, uh, we're supposed to share some tips mm -hmm. to, to the audience uh, for if you find that useful. And looking back, if we, you know, looking at the growth journey of May.com, there are a few things that I thought was very useful um, that are key ingredients of the, the, the growth path of our business. And I think probably one of the most important thing of them, the, of them all is the ability or the, the, the necessity, I would say, to think out of the box. Because when we started um, you know, five, six years ago, we suddenly realized, wow, it's a very big industry, but we were competing with people like IKEA, John Lewis, and DFS, very serious, serious businesses. They have loads of cash, and they could easily crush us. You know, should they choose to do that, we were, you know, we were selling a bunch of uh, pieces without any brand, without any traffic to the website. Um, and most importantly, we don't, we don't have any uh, authority in the industry, and it's very hard to get people to work with us. And then we started to look around. We realized that we were not the only ones struggling. There are also some other people, well, we, we call them entrepreneurs too, you know, young designers, people who are, who are just freshly graduated, who are, who are also on their own. They are freelancers, they are, they are trying to make a living. And with the recession, somehow all the big brands, you know, the people who I just mentioned, they become very risk adverse. So they stop innovating, they stop working with designers, they stop promoting young designers who they view as risky. And also on the other hand, they have been working in a certain way for the last 50 or maybe 100 years. So something that you should, work, should know for the furniture industry, which is really fascinating, is the way they work, they would you know, they would think of their collections by um, seasons, spring collections, summer collections, or autumn collections. And they would send their buyers to the fairs. They would say, the buyer would say, hey, I like that chair. And I would buy 500 chairs of those. I would put in the warehouse, and then I would pray that this chair sells. Yeah? <laughs> Sometimes they do sell, but quite often they don't. And if they don't, they have to promote them, they have to discount them. Sometimes they have to get rid of them. And we found that always quite you know, interesting for today's internet world because you have to wait six months until you can see the first product you know, every twice a year. And secondly, you know, what if you can, instead of buying big batches, doing something more frequent and working with smaller people, small batches in a more you know, tweet, tweaked but also more interesting way. So we team up with all the young designers who are struggling just like us. Um, and we worked with so many of them that we, instead of launching two new collections per year, we were launching two new collections a week. Much smaller collections, but much more frequently and much fresher. So I think that was a major decision and key, um, a key, key, key moment of um, our beginning of the history, uh, the story where we, we decided something that the major, the, the big guys of the industry were not doing, but we could afford to, to do, taking some risk and taking them on um, um, a, a part of the business that would, they would not uh, be considering of taking. And the other challenge that we were facing also in the beginning was the, the whole, I guess that it's quite um, similar to a lot of other online businesses, is the touch and feel factor. You know, as by, by nature, when you're online, you are virtual. And what we are doing in the furniture industry is very tactile. People are, a lot of people want to touch and feel their products before they make the purchase. You know, even if you spend 500 pounds, 800 pounds for a sofa, it is still a lot of money. Now we have a showroom in Soho, but that only covers a fraction of the audience. So what do we do? 
you know, when we compare ourselves to people like John Lewis, Ikea, we have a significant disadvantage of not having enough stores. Um, so that day we, we did something quite interesting. We uploaded the whole database of a customer on Google Map. Not sure how legal that was, so <laughs> keep it for yourself. But we just did it for ourselves, just for fun. And, and we somehow realized that in a city like London, we have almost at least one customer in every street of London. You know, we say, wow, you know, wouldn't that be amazing if just some of those customers accept to become our showroom? Then we'll beat John Lewis and Ikea, you know, by mouse, we'll have the biggest showroom network of the world. Um, and that's exactly what we did. So we launched this initiative called Unboxed, and we invite the customer who have purchased from us to open their homes to other potential customers. So we first uploaded their pictures of their purchase online. So if you go on made.com today, you'll see a sofa, and you'll see other people's sofa in their real situation in their home, and you can ask questions to the customers. Are you happy with the sofa? Do you, do you like your purchase experience? And you can see them on a Google map as well. So if you're not too far away from that customer, you can say, hey, can I come in and check the sofa? And, <laughs> and some people do do that, you know, <laughs> believe, believe it or not. And, and, and this is you know, one of the many things we've done that I think turn our weakness, weaknesses into a strength. And things that big guys, you know, I mean, think of the big corporations, they have so many constraints and so many risk aversions, can I say that? Yeah, um, that they cannot allow themselves to take this um, bold initiatives. And that's where we as startup have a significant advantage. Um, so yeah, what I think, I think, Nadine, if you have any questions, feel free to yes. ask, but. Come and sit down, that's brilliant, thank you very much. <laughs>